Lauren Giddings was an ambitious, popular and intelligent woman and in 2011 she'd finished law school and was preparing for a bright and successful future. But little did she know that the man who lived next door to her had developed an eerie obsession with her and would go on to destroy the very promising life that she had ahead of her. In June 2011, Lauren went missing and all that was found of her was a dismembered torso. This is the case of Stephen McDaniel. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Today's case is the one that you've asked me to cover a lot, so I finally got round to doing it. Also, just want to say a massive thank you to every single one of you who comes back on a regular basis, and to those of you who might be new, well, I deliver my crime content on a Wednesday and a Sunday, every single week, religiously. So if you like crime and you like consistency, then this might just be the channel for you. So why not subscribe, get your notifications on. Also, I am going to be releasing occasional extra content on this channel. And to those of you who support me on YouTube membership and Patreon, I'm also putting extra videos on there to say thank you to you. Let's get on with today's case. So who was Lauren Giddings? Well, she was born on the 18th of April, 1984 in Maryland. She was the eldest and much loved daughter of her parents, Karen and Bill Giddings. She also had two sisters, Caitlin and Sarah. Bill and Karen raised them in an idyllic way. They had a lovely house at the end of a gravel path in Howard County. Lauren grew up with dogs and rabbits. Apparently she had peacocks and goats, turkeys and chinchillas. And she grew up with a real love of country music. She was a country girl at heart. Apparently she just loved animals. She had a dog who she loved called Butterbean as an adult. So she was incredibly popular. She had a really active social life. People who knew her said that she was very kind. She was someone who always saw the good in people. She liked to try to help everyone and anyone wherever she could. And to some degree that could have played into her downfall because sometimes being nice to everyone can invite individuals who don't deserve a place and a space in your life, that place. And that isn't to blame her in any way, quite the contrary. It's just that if you're a predator, you see being an open, loving and honest person as a vulnerability. And that can mean that these individuals seek to take advantage of people like Lauren. When she was growing up, she was really athletic. She liked to play softball and field hockey in high school. Apparently she loved going for runs. She was very into her running. And in 2006, she actually graduated from Agnes Scott College. She'd been majoring in political science with a minor in religious studies. She was incredibly invested in the area of faith. And that was something that was really important to her throughout her life. She met her boyfriend, David, in 2007, and they'd actually planned to move in together once she'd passed the bar that she was studying. So because she wanted to pursue a life with law, she'd actually moved to Macon College in 2008. And then in 2011, she graduated from Mercer Law School. And so at this point, she was studying to take the George Bar exam and she was 27 years of age. So she's somebody who's invested in herself. She's worked very hard. She's got lots of interests and hobbies that clearly suggest that she's really deeply motivated. And anybody who studied law or knows about the academic level required for that recognises just how intelligent you have to be to succeed in that particular area. A friend of hers said she would be friends with anyone. And that, like I said, is a virtue that could to some degree have contributed to what we're talking about today. Lauren allegedly had, and I quote, an uncommon empathy for the underdog, for the socially alienated. So she was somebody who saw those individuals who others, shall we say, didn't pay attention to or purposefully ignored. She saw those as individuals who are often under acknowledged and were interpreted incorrectly and she would go out of her way to be friends with them but allegedly that wasn't because she felt sorry for them but because she had this tenacity and this capability to actually see the good 
in every person that she came across, which is something that's enviable to be an individual who can genuinely look at others and see the very best in them, even when others reject and abandon them. It says something incredible about her. And it also really solidifies why she would have gone into an academic career within law, because you have to be willing to be able to see past what somebody's accused of, for example, and believe in their best. Particularly if you genuinely think that an individual is innocent, but they're accused of something absolutely heinous. And clearly Lauren was well fitted and well suited to this possibility in the future. She was the first of her three sisters who actually left home and her parents at the time when she'd gone to study were just thrilled that she'd just always been able to succeed in everything that she did. In fact, her mum Karen said that she had such a passion for learning and when they'd been looking around at possible places for her daughter to go, they'd actually gone around more than two dozen campuses. So this gives you an impression of an unbelievably tight bond between mother and daughter and actually a tight bond between all family members. The research I've done demonstrates that Lauren was just absolutely loved and adored, but also that this seems to be a theme that existed within the family full stop, that they are just a really connected, bonded family, a family that most of us would look at and wish we could achieve. Let's look at Stephen McDaniel. So Stephen McDaniel was born on the 9th of September, that's in 1985. And when I've looked at his past, I would say when you consider his childhood dynamics, it seemed relatively normal. He was a member of the church. He sang in the Atlanta Boys Choir, so clearly doing things that are community orientated. Again, much like Lauren, there is an element of faith there. When he was at school, I would say he wasn't popular, but he wasn't somebody who stood out as an oddball or an individual that caused that much attention. One of the things he did stand out for to some degree was academia. He worked really hard. He did well academically, he even earned a presidential scholarship to Mercer University where he studied business. So he, to all intents and purposes, is afforded a natural inclination for academic prowess and is succeeding. And he should be looking forward to the most incredible, successful future. After he's done the actual initial studying in business, he enrolls in Mercer Law School. And what people have said about McDaniel is as he got older, some behaviours stood out. So a friend of his who studied with him and roomed with him basically suggested that he did have some odd tendencies. He said that he'd wear chain mail, he'd grow his fingernails out, he wouldn't take very many showers and he would find interest in things that other people didn't necessarily think very much of. For example, he was obsessed with zombies and the idea of a zombie apocalypse and apparently he would ask this question to people that he met regularly like what would you do if there was a zombie apocalypse and he could be quite reactive if you didn't engage with him in that way that he felt was appropriate. So as in answer the question and answer it in a way that he felt was acceptable. Somebody, for example, suggested that they'd just let the zombie bite them because he didn't really think that they'd fare well surviving and they'd like to see how it would be to be a zombie. And he walked away, slammed his door and just disappeared for the entire evening. So clearly that wasn't the correct answer. But it's unusual to wear chain mail. And part of this is apparently to do with the fact that he believed that it could genuinely happen. So he wanted to be prepared. And one of his friends or acquaintances said that there was an occasion that he actually witnessed him pulling his hair out. Not trichotigomania, where people are actually pulling their hair out purposefully and willfully, not a psychological issue with that. More that he was just kind of going through his hair and whatever loose hair was there, he would take out. And then he'd collect the strands and basically roll it into a ball and then he would put rubber bands around it and keep it on his desk, which is very odd. Apparently that friend said it was the most disgusting thing that they'd ever seen and they did tell him. Also, hygiene was a bit of an issue. He didn't wash very often, as I've noted, but also he didn't clean up very effectively. So that would be grating if you lived with him. And it also says something potentially about self-esteem. So if somebody struggles with their self-esteem, often they're an individual who won't shower or wash as much as they should because they have an issue with self-value. 
but arguably if he's waiting for the zombie apocalypse all the time, particularly if the zombie apocalypse involves World War Z type zombies, then maybe he didn't want to get undressed all the time because of the fact that he thought that his chain mail would be off and then he'd become some kind of victim of such an apocalypse, but very odd. And there's an emotional immaturity there as well and a paranoia because most of us aren't walking around imagining that we genuinely have to protect ourselves from the onslaught of some kind of a zombie invasion. Now, Lauren and Stephen did know each other and they knew each other because first of all, they'd attended law school together, they'd graduated in the same year and also, most importantly, I suppose, is that they lived next door to each other. So they lived in this block of apartments called Barristers Hall and they both moved there in 2008 and they moved there in the same week in 2008. In fact, Lauren's mum recalls that she'd actually seen him and it was really unusual because when she met him for the first time and said hello, as you would, because you're a pleasant, well-adjusted human, he almost jumped and there was a social awkwardness towards him, but equally he was pleasant and responded. Now, although Lauren and McDaniel did know each other, they weren't considered friends. They didn't have lots and lots of interactions, but she was always friendly. Whenever she saw him, they would chat. There was never any conflict between them and there was no negative exchanges. She went out of her way to be pleasant. So we have no background or history of problematic behavior between the two at all. Like I said, one of the things about McDaniel that stands out is he was quite a jumpy person, quite a socially awkward person, somebody who spent quite a lot of time by himself. Conversely, of course, we have Lauren. She's somebody who just excels at everything. She joined an offbeat running club, the Hash House Harriers. She attended mass almost daily at St. Joseph Catholic Church, which was just a few blocks away from her apartment. Apparently, she would regularly organize family dinners for her close circle of friends, which meant that they could have some respite from the academic slog, so to speak. And friends would say that unlike McDaniel, who was quite socially awkward and a bit challenging at times to be around, Lauren would literally walk into a room and it would just light up. If she smiled, everyone felt instantly brighter. Her friends actually laughed and said she was a Hollywood character sprung to life, the bright, kooky Elle Woods in Legally Blonde. So they genuinely look at her as this all-rounder, beautiful, talented, funny, athletic, giving, empathic, somebody who you want in your life, literally a ray of sunshine. Now, as I've said, Lauren and McDaniel were not close friends, they were more acquaintances, but she felt safe around him. In fact, when people used to call out his strangeness, she said that she'd be safe because they had a good relationship and she actually defended him. They did have other commonalities, though. So they both joined Mercer's chapter of the Federalist Society in their first year of law school. And in 2010 to 11, that was their final academic year, Lauren was actually president and McDaniel was vice president. So they did have paths that crossed and they obviously had similar interests and similar beliefs as far as in what they believed in what they were doing. But if you think about them, they were just absolute opposites. She's this vivacious, gorgeous, flowing and glowing public face of the organisation she represents. And he, of course, is very much in the background, but working really hard. It's well worth knowing that people who know McDaniel who are completely surprised about the story I'm telling today because no one expected that he was going to do what we're gonna cover. The reality is they struggle because he was a very diligent individual and he wasn't someone to all intents and purposes who screamed violent perpetrator. So we get to Wednesday, June 29, 2011. At this point, one of Lauren's best friends, Katie, she's really concerned because Katie hasn't heard from Lauren in four days and this is not the way their relationship works. So being a really good friend, she contacts Lauren's friends and family and other friends hadn't seen her for quite a while. They'd seen her on the Saturday morning because they'd been out for drinks on the Friday night, but there hadn't been that consistent connection that the friends were used to. Caitlin, who was Lauren's sister, she realised that she'd messaged Lauren on the 24th of June 
and she notices that she hadn't received a response and she was at the time when she messaged her sister on the way home from her honeymoon so you can understand that she's in a bubble of love she's just had the most incredible time she wants to speak to her sister but she's not necessarily computing in the same way that she would that her sister hasn't responded to her so of course when she realizes that other people haven't heard from her sister she starts to get really concerned so she calls around other family members and it becomes apparent that no one has heard from Lauren in days and you can imagine can't you how the family member's stomach just drops because anyone who has lost sight of somebody that they love even for seconds at time will relate to that feeling of instant dread it is absolutely sickening and hopefully for the most part for the majority of us that dread has been alleviated quite quickly because our loved one turns up but imagine connecting that you haven't heard from a loved one in days and no one else has and they're not answering the phone and they're not making contact with anyone and there's no post on social media you couldn't help but fear the worst now one of the reasons that people hadn't connected the dots is because she was studying for the bar exam which is just such a lot of work and you can imagine that as a diligent academic, and Lauren was, that maybe she would just hide herself away and revise. And so when people aren't getting an instant return on their message, it's not provoking too much worry. Because clearly, they're only seeing it as an individual experience that she hasn't got back to them. Not that she isn't getting back to anyone. So they were expecting at this moment in time that she would be contacting them less frequently than normal. So. Caitlin is now really concerned so she calls Lauren's friend Ashley and she asks Ashley who lives where Lauren does to knock on Lauren's door and she goes and she knocks on the door and there's no answer. Now the thing about Ashley is she knows where Lauren has a spare key so she enters her apartment with a group of friends and it always concerns me when somebody has a spare key and other people know where it is because all it takes is for somebody to be watching when you place that key somewhere and they have direct access and opportunity to your home. And I do appreciate that a lot of people do it because they don't want to get locked out or they're leaving a key because somebody's coming around to look after their animals and so on and so forth. But it doesn't take long to get another key cut or it doesn't take long to remove that key altogether. And a lot of times people don't even change the locks when a key goes missing. They just believe that they've made a mistake, not left it there, they've lost it, and so on and so forth. And what you don't realize is unknowingly for you, you have literally given access to your home, sometimes to a malevolent predator. So it concerns me that friends knew where that spare key was, because like I said, if they knew where it was, who else knew? They walk in, obviously scared and concerned because you don't know what you're going to find. When somebody just seems to have gone off the radar, it could be that you're going to walk in and find them unwell, deceased. These are things that happen. So you can imagine the level of trepidation as they walk in through that door. But Lauren isn't there. But there's an instant growing concern because the friends notice that there are items which she would never have left behind if she'd gone away. And they're still in the apartment, so her phone's there. And everybody knows you don't go anywhere with your phone. You might mistakenly leave it in the house for, I don't know, 15 minutes before turning your car around and going back to collect it just in case somebody calls you, even though you were only bombing to the shops. So many of us do that. Our phone has become our connection and communication with the rest of the world. It's our safety net. We think that if we don't have it and our car breaks down, what will we do? We use it for our sat nav so that we don't get lost. It's become essentially a mainframe computer in the size of a matchbox these days. So they know there's no way that she would have left her phone. And also it's out of battery. So that suggests that there is a possibility it's been left for a period of time. Also, they notice her laptop, her keys, her purse. So they would have gone with her to some degree, particularly her keys and purse. You're gonna need some money. And you're certainly going to need to be able to get back into your property. And even if you've got a spare key, it doesn't make sense that you would leave your actual house keys on the desk with the one way that you can afford to get around, which is your purse with your ATM cards in 
and she's studying for the bar so even if she's gone somewhere the likelihood is she's going to have taken her laptop with her and they charge a phone because they're clever and they want to figure out well, okay when was the last contact because they could be going over the top at this point and they could be thinking to themselves well okay this feels really unusual but maybe she's gone for a run so if we can just charge a phone look at it and then make sense of when the last contact that she's had because who knows they could charge it and 20 minutes before they arrived she could have been chatting with somebody about meeting them for a coffee so this is going to be something that hopefully placates the fear that they've got and makes them realize that they're overreacting so they look and they see to their horror that the last time she sent a text was on the saturday four days earlier now at this point they are really scared and concerned as any loving friend would be because this just does not make sense now as the friends have been going into the flat and looking around obviously they've made a certain amount of noise there will be some conversation and so at some point this is alerted mcdaniel and he ends up coming out he's heard lauren's friends and he decides that he wants to assist them now they think this is really strange first of all he's literally never come out of his apartment when they've been there before and so this feels a little bit out of character but again he and Lauren knew each other. So they're probably thinking to themselves, well, the reason that he's brought himself into the picture is because he's genuinely concerned about somebody that he might not have a really close relationship with, but that he knows and that to some degree cares for. But it just sticks with them as a little bit odd. It's not long after this that her friends go ahead and report her missing to the police. And at this point, two officers come and they start looking for Lauren they can't find her and the police are clearly taking this seriously first of all she's been missing for more than 24 hours secondly this is completely out of character and most importantly they can see she's not had access to money she's certainly not communicated with any of her friends so it could mean that she's been harmed or that she's come to some harm for example in an accident we get to june the 30th 2011 at this point, detectives and a crime lab tech team are investigating in Lauren's apartment. But it doesn't really turn anything up in that moment because they're interrupted. They're interrupted by this terrible odour. So even though they're in the apartment looking for clues and information, this smell wafts in. And of course, one of the detectives immediately recognizes that smell in fact he said we all smell things in life that smell bad and that of a body or a decomposing body is one of the worst things you'll smell it has a very distinctive smell so they all in that apartment become aware of this terrible smell and what it's likely to be so they begin to follow the smell and I think we can all relate to moments in our life when something happens that we know we'll never forget. And when you listen to investigators talk about finding human decay, they often talk about the fact that from that moment onwards, it wouldn't matter where they were, the moment they smell that particular smell, it is so unique to human decomposition that they immediately know what they're dealing with. It's said that the aversion to a rotting human corpse is so enormous because it's a protective mechanism in our survival. Clearly, if you can smell a rotting human corpse, you don't want to go near it because that could mean that you'd be in danger yourself or it can mean that there's disease and so on and so forth. So that's why we have this hardwired reality that when we smell it, it causes us absolute chaos and we instantaneously realise that something foreboding has occurred. But for the investigators, this is definitely something that they need to follow up on because they recognise that there could be a terrible outcome in this case and that could be that that smell belongs to Lauren's body. So they literally follow the smell of death and they end up in a bin. And it's a bin that's just outside the block of apartments. And when they look inside the bin, to their horror, they find a torso of a white female. It's wrapped in plastic bags. And even though they clearly can't confirm at this moment in time that it's Lauren's body, one would imagine the immediate connection occurs because she's missing 
it's just outside her block of apartments and it's a white body which clearly matches the description that we'd expect Lauren to be given. They immediately start to search for the rest of Lauren's body, but they can't find it. Bear in mind, the bin collection for that particular apartment block, that was due to arrive later that day. So if the police hadn't been called, hadn't attended those apartments, they would not have found that torso at the time. And that means, and this is horrifying to conceive, that what happened to Lauren may never have been discovered. She may have remained as a missing person case. And that is terrifying. Because if we're talking about a murder as gruesome and bloody and disturbing as what we are, then the killer certainly has a potential to go on to kill other people too. That just absolutely makes sense, it's logical. So if her body had been removed, and the chances are she would never have been given justice, and also other people may have died. Now they do tests on the torso and understandably it comes back that it belongs to Lauren. One of the detectives would later say that they'd literally never seen anything like it. They said, who could have done this? Because truthfully, only a monster could do something like that. It was absolutely horrible. The investigations by the police revealed when they were trying to piece together what had happened to her, that Lauren had sent a final email to a boyfriend on June the 25th. And in that email, she'd actually written to him that she thought that somebody had tried to break into her apartment two days earlier. She'd actually referred to them as hoodlums. And so she had this suspicion that somebody might have been trying to get into her apartment. Also, it came to light that around a year earlier, Lauren had actually told a friend that she felt like somebody had been in her apartment, that somebody had moved things around. This has been when she'd been away for a few days. But it's one of those things, isn't it? When you walk into a place that is very familiar to you and it feels unfamiliar, and a lot of people will say this, they will go into their house or into their bedroom and they'll automatically know that even though nothing is absolutely out of place, it just feels unfamiliar. Whether it's a psychic connection with what plays out, a connection with a feeling that's gone from being safe to unsafe, these things instinctually seem to occur to many humans where you genuinely think, I can't put my finger on it, but something feels entirely off. And that's clearly what happened for Lauren. So she imagines that things have been moved around, but equally, you're gonna try to believe in the bias of security and say to yourself, oh, I'm just going a bit mad here. The reality is maybe I've moved it. All the while having that sinister feeling that maybe you're actually correct. And maybe a stranger has been in your home and moved things around. But because there's no chaos, because things aren't littered all over, because things haven't been stolen, equally you think to yourself, well, if you were gonna come into my home, it would be to steal from me and everything's still in place, which again would reaffirm that sense that maybe you're exaggerating, maybe you're becoming completely lost in your fears and fantasies as opposed to the reality. Because as I said, in that situation, nothing's gone missing. So it doesn't really make sense that somebody would have been in your apartment. But this indicates that Lauren was probably right, that she was somebody who had that instinct and knowledge and was able to gauge the reality of what had played out, which was that somebody had indeed been looking around her apartment while she'd been away. Now, the last footage of Lauren seen alive was at Zaxby's drive through This is a fast food restaurant. So she was seen at 6.30 p.m. on June the 25th, 2011. And as the police continue their investigations, they decide that they need to figure out what played out in her apartment, if anything did. So the police go in and they take luminol. And obviously luminol is used to look for blood traces and it lights up. So when they put it out there, they find that the bathroom walls above the bathtub have got blood splatter all over it. And in addition to this unfolding horror, an apartment on the floor below, which was basically empty, had blood stains which matched Lauren's DNA. And those blood stains were in the fridge. So it's actually been assumed that the torso of Lauren was stored there before it was finally dumped in the bin. And there is just something 
so inhumane. And of course, we know these predators, these killers are inhumane. They don't have empathy in the way that you or I do. They don't feel fear in the way that you or I do. They certainly don't have conscience in the way that you or I do. But every single time we cover a case where somebody is so callously discarded, a human body that belonged to an individual of infinite meaning to this world has just been discarded like rubbish. It's really symbolic of the distinction that these predators place on life versus the way that we feel about human life. Because that was Lauren. She was an amazing, incredible, beautiful, fantastic human being. She was loved and adored by so many. And this person just chopped her up and denied her a funeral as far as the funeral that her family would deserve and threw her away like some useless piece of rubbish. It's horrifying. Now, it doesn't take long for Stephen McDonald's to become a person of interest in this case because the police wanted to search the apartments of Lauren's neighbours and Stephen was literally the only person who refused. And he said, it's the lawyer in me. I'm just always protective of my space, which makes no sense whatsoever. Because the lawyer in you should be saying, have nothing to hide, come in. That's what the lawyer in you should do because anyone, I don't know, with an ounce of sense would know that otherwise it's like shining a spotlight of potential guilt on you because you are making it difficult for the investigators. And bear in mind, this is about Lauren. It's not about Stephen McDaniels. It's about Lauren. And he should wish to contribute in any way, shape or form that he can to ensure that the police know what's happened to her. So blocking that, is deeply suspicious. And I guess some people could say, well, maybe he's fearful of the authorities and thinks that they could potentially pin something on him because he's worked in the field of law academically by studying and therefore he's aware that at times, I don't know, police have done things that are a little bit dubious to get the person that they want brought in and sometimes wrongly imprisoned. But that's really rare. And Lauren has been lovely to McDaniels. So he should be willing to open his door to the police to do anything that would assist the case. So they're deeply concerned now about him. They feel like this indicates he's got something to hide. He later did actually, to be fair, let one detective walk through his home, but the stipulation was, I have to be there whilst you do that. Now, again, I don't think that that's too untoward. If you wanna be present when an investigator comes into your home so you can make sure that they don't plant anything, then, if you're that paranoid, go ahead and do it. Now, at this point, neighbours were all being spoken to about Lauren's disappearance, but they hadn't actually been told that part of her body had been found. They're still, as far as they're concerned, just trying to contribute to assist the investigators in finding Lauren and hopefully bringing her home safely. Now, it's later that day, Stephen McDaniels gives an interview to the local news station WGXA. During this, he goes on about how great she is, what a personable person she is, what a people person she is, that she is nice as can be, which she is. She's all of those things. But how dare those words come out of this killer's mouth? How dare he say those lines about this woman whose life he's stolen? He also says that there was no sign of a break-in so that in his mind, all he can think about is that she's gone for a run, someone could have snatched her. But of course, during the interview, the reporter reveals that the body's been found. And his reaction, the immediate psychological knee jolt that you see play out, that moment of recognition, that her body's been found? This isn't something that he's computed, of course. Did you hang out with anyone at the time, anything like that? I mean, no, no, no one has seen her since Saturday. I haven't seen anything. I mean, I've always seen noise outside, but it's just people walking by pretty much. I mean, we, we just don't know where she is. I mean, what about um, in the, like, the parking lot area? I know they've been doing a lot of, I think that's where they have recovered the body or whatever they recovered from there. Body? Um, had you heard, had you seen anything there? Had you seen anything there? I, I mean, we don't know if this is the same person. 
You know what I mean? Like, they took out a body there earlier. We don't know if it's the same person or not. So that's how we're trying to ask people if they know who lived there. Are you okay, sir? I think I need to sit down. Okay. So now he's in a circumstance where investigators will likely be able to find out who the perpetrator is. And he wasn't expecting that. Because clearly he thought that the bins would have been collected and that would have meant that Lauren's body had disappeared forever. And that cerebral and visceral, guttural reaction of, I just need to sit down, that's because his knees literally go weak because suddenly there is a strong possibility that whoever is guilty for this crime is going to be brought to justice. And he's somebody who studied law. He knows what the implications would be if you happen to be found guilty of such a crime. So him walking away, sitting with his back to the camera, part of that will be to do with the fact that he's trying to decide how to look, how to be, how to act, how to get himself back together what's the next move like playing chess he comes back and of course we see he gets really emotional on camera and plays out this incredible role of a grieving friend not knowing how anyone could hurt her not knowing why anyone would do this what a psychopathic question to ask because he knows the true motive he knows why someone would do this. And he knows because he's the person who did it. And yet he's managed in that moment to gather his thoughts together and to put on that mask. I'm a grieving friend, horrified by this. Who would do this to such a lovely human being? And every second of that deception is captured in technical or on camera. And the interviewer is taken in. The interviewer feels bad. They feel like they've traumatised him by giving him that news. Even backtracks, don't they? Says, oh, it could be, it's not been confirmed. So he does a good job of seeming blindsided, but maybe too good a job. Because he's not close to Lauren, and that reaction would be more fitting for somebody who genuinely would be deeply affected by her loss. Now, the same day that they find Lauren's body, her father, Bill, he had to drive 700 miles because he knows someone has to identify his daughter's body. And that's what he thinks he's gonna go and do. He sets off in the morning and he actually isn't gonna to have to face this alone because his brother, George, and his brother-in-law, Perry Hoke, who's a DC patrol officer, they fly to be with him. Also, there are another three Giddings relatives from Georgia, they go there, and there's also a Baptist minister. But he said, when he heard the chief speaking to him, apparently speaking very softly to him, father to father, Bill said in spite of all those people being there to support him, he just felt entirely alone. And he said he thought during that conversation with the chief, where's the body? Where's Lauren? When's he gonna take me to her? But the problem was that the investigators themselves didn't know how to tell him. They didn't know how to speak the words to tell the truth about the state of his daughter's body. They said everybody was really struggling with how to tell him what happened to his daughter and how he found her. And Chief Burns said, I don't know if you can ever fully prepare yourself. You know, it's hard to tell somebody your daughter's been dismembered and her torso was thrown in a trash can. You know, it's hard. So we see these two men, the father who's lost his daughter in the most tragic way, and the chief in charge of having to tell him the truth about how his daughter's body has been discarded like rubbish and cut into pieces. This moment where the professional and the personal merge, and Chief Burns is just a dad speaking to another dad, telling him the absolute worst news in the world. As I've mentioned, Stephen McDaniels has become a person of interest as far as the police are concerned, so they take him in to interview him. During this particular initial interview, he doesn't give a lot of information, he provides really short answers, responds 
I don't know to a lot of the questions. And one of the detectives said, we want to give you the opportunity to tell it so you don't look like a monster. But he still didn't provide any meaningful details. And it's an interesting thing when you watch interrogators do that, when they say to somebody, explain what happened. It could have been an accident. It could have been something that happened when you were having some kind of psychotic break. You seem like a really decent human being. This doesn't seem like the kind of character you'd be at all. And it's all giving them this breadcrumb trail to admitting guilt, but doing it in a less socially horrific way than you would by saying well actually i am this kind of predator who went and did something horrific and dismembered the body of this poor woman who'd always been nice to me it gives you an opportunity to give an excuse but really it's all about getting you to admit guilt so this interview that isn't really going anywhere initially carries on into the early hours of july the 1st 2011 and of course they've been searching mcdaniel's home and at one point, one of the detectives points out that they found condoms in McDaniel's apartment. And this is quite strange because he'd said that he was a virgin. He said he was saving himself for marriage. He was deeply religious, apparently, just like Lauren was. So he's arguing that he's the kind of person that he's going to save himself. And actually, there'd been some really intriguing perspectives given by people that knew him where they would lived in the same place as McDaniel's. And on one particular occasion, a girl had been round partying with some of his flatmates and she had decided that she wanted to, shall we say, get intimate, get a little bit intimate, a little bit frisky with anybody. She was in one of those moods and McDaniels was present in his bedroom but wasn't parting with the group. So she decided to just sling off and get, shall we say, a little bit romantic with McDaniels. But apparently when she went into his room and she got into bed with him and I do believe placed her hand in an inappropriate place, he just ignored her and didn't react at all. And she ended up leaving. Now, don't get me wrong, that description could be quite traumatising for somebody who doesn't want to have sex with somebody before marriage because understandably somebody walking in and being very sexually provocative with you when you are not in the mindset where you would know how to deal with that is going to mean that it's awkward but you would imagine that he would respond that he'd say can you please leave or I'm not into that so there does seem to be something really problematic about his relating to females and even though he said he's going to be a virgin until he gets married and that behaviour indicates that he definitely didn't want an intimate connection with a female, it still doesn't make sense, therefore, that he would have condoms. And when they ask him where he got them, Stephen McDaniel said he'd gone into other people's apartments whilst they were out and he'd taken them from them. Now, of course, at that point, he's made a huge error of judgement because he's basically admitted to the police that he's gone into other homes and stolen from them and that the condoms that are in his apartment belong to other people. So now they have literally a connection with stolen goods. And that means that they can arrest him for burglary, which he likely hadn't done the maths on when admitting to that particular reality. Considering his studied law, you'd have thought that would be a rookie error. Anyway, this allows him to remain arrested and remain in custody and this enables them to continue to build the case against him whilst he's actually in prison. And so he's then charged with two counts of burglary and at this point is denied bail. So the police, bearing in mind, he's admitted that he's got stolen goods and that he's been in other people's properties, they get a warrant and they are able to search Stephen's apartment. And it's a little bit scary, genuinely. When you think about these kind of predators and killers, when you look, at what's going on behind closed doors, it's so absolutely chilling. So they find lots and lots of incriminating evidence. First of all, they discover that he had been stalking Lauren. So he's got a master key to the apartment complex. He's got literally hundreds of photos of Lauren. He's even got a scrunched up pair of Lauren's underwear. He's got packaging for a Stanley brand hacksaw. Bear in mind what's happened to her body. And then when they get his laptop and they go through it, they can see that he's constantly on Lauren's social media. And my God, there is so much violent porn on there. And he'd even got a selfie stick and he'd attached the camera to it and he'd been filming Lauren 
through the window. It also had information about her location. So he was tracking her. I mean, this is absolutely horrifying, isn't it? That Lauren is living next door to this monster who is tracking her every move, who is fantasizing about possibilities with her. Apparently, he'd also been somebody who'd been clear about romantic intentions towards her and she rebuffed him again and again and again and this demonstrates that he certainly had some kind of interest in her that was unhealthy because she's saying no to him and yet he's continuing to fixate on her to fantasize about her when they looked on his search history he had search terms including molest sleeping girl and nude lauren giddings He'd even posted on blogs and forums about how much he hated women and how much he wanted to hurt them. And if you think about incel forums, which are obviously the involuntary celibate forums where men who feel very aggrieved and alienated by women because they believe that they deserve to be slept with and these women are not giving them what they want, you often find these groups of men communicating about how they despise women because they have an expectation of them. And if they're not giving them what they need and deserve, as far as they're concerned, well, they deserve to be hated. So this is deeply incriminating and also horribly illuminating about what's gone on behind McDaniel's doors. When they bring a cadaver dog, it also alerts in Stephen's bedroom and bathroom. So that would likely mean that Lauren's body, parts of it at least, were in there. On July the 2nd, 2011, they actually find a hacksaw in a storage closet. And when they do analysis on it, it contains Lauren's DNA. And that's the same hacksaw that the packaging was found in Stephen's apartment for. So he's bang to rights, isn't he? They have an absolute link to him on so many different levels, from the stalking to the actual weapon that might have been used to dismember Lauren's body, to those unhealthy searches that indicate there is something malevolent going on in McDaniel's mind. Now, not long after Lauren's torso had been discovered, a former roommate of Stephen McDaniel's actually called the police and they spoke to the police and said, listen, McDaniel's used to tell me about how he could get away with committing the perfect murder. He said that he'd use chloroform to gain dominance over his victim, then he'd dismember the body and then he'd scatter the body parts in the woods because that would ensure that the body wouldn't be found. And he also used to ask people how they would commit the perfect murder. So one can say, well, this is something that people could chat about, having a drink, having a smoke, having a bit of a giggle, and they don't really mean anything. But when you think about what he was actually doing, what he was searching, what he was connecting with, all of that stalking behavior, you do have to ask yourself, was he asking for tips? And also, what kind of a person is constantly asking those kind of questions? It suggests that he has this fixation with killing. And the fixation with zombies is a part of that as well, because zombies are the ultimate killers. They don't necessarily die. They are just an animal that's devoid of empathy and compassion who attacks again and again and again, and of course, kills without conscience. So he has a connection with that as well. On the 2nd of August 2011, Stephen's actually charged with first degree murder, which is unsurprising because even though he is not being helpful with the investigation, even though he's not at that point until now admitted what he's done, it doesn't matter because it's absolutely clear that he's guilty. And the next day after he's charged with her murder, he pleads not guilty. Of course he does. Why would you plead guilty? I mean, there's no evidence at all to incriminate him, is there? I mean, he's certainly innocent. It's obvious. Why else would he have her underwear in his room? Why else would he have a master key to all the apartments? Why else would he have literally hundreds of pictures of her? Why else would he be searching terms like naked Lauren Giddings? Why, if he was guilty, would he have any of that? That suggests that he's completely innocent. I mean, if I'm not gathering data and information on my next door neighbours, I don't know what I'm doing on a normal week. If I am not popping next door, stealing Chris's underwear and then bringing it home. I don't know, just so I have some kind of reminder of him. I think I've got my day wrong. If I am not seriously 
getting keys cut for every single home on my estate and just having a wander around when they're away for a weekend and moving things about. I don't know what I am doing with my time. Totally innocent. Only innocent people are like that. We get to the 23rd of August 2011 and he is charged with seven counts of sexual exploitation of children on top of everything else. Why? Because when the police are going through the absolute enormous amount of information that tells us what a deviant McDaniels is, they also find a flash drive on a Mercer lanyard in Stephen's apartment containing images of children engaged in sexual acts with adults. So yeah, he's also a paedophile and child molester. And even though I haven't got evidence to say that he actually touched children personally, the reality is if you're witnessing video content or photographic content of children being abused by grotesque human beings that are excuses for human beings, you are a perpetrator of child abuse because you are literally gratifying yourself whilst watching and viewing the most despicable content where children are literally having their lives ruined by these horrific human beings who should be there to protect them. So now we know the true depravity and depths of McDaniel's reality. He is an absolute horrific human being. And actually, Lauren's parents went ahead and sued Stephen McDaniel's for a wrongful death by homicide. So they personally sued him. And it was said consistent with his perverse hope to get away with the perfect murder. McDaniel refuses to confess, refuses to provide any details concerning where he disposed or dismembered parts of the body of Lauren Giddings and displays no conscience or remorse whatsoever. He has committed a craven, criminal and horrendous act, depriving a vibrant young woman of her promising life and depriving her parents of the joy and companionship of the rest of her life. So I understand why they personally sued him because you're suing him for the loss of the future that you should have been able to expect with your child. Now in April 2014, it's agreed that the charges for both the child sexual exploitation and the burglary will be dropped. And it's at this point, Stephen McDaniel subsequently confesses to the murder of Lauren. He also confesses to the dismemberment of her body. And he did this just one week before his trial was supposed to start. And of course, that deal, it was also agreed that he wouldn't go to trial. I don't know. I just think a public gallery with various things to throw at individuals like him may be an appropriate course of action. Because even though I know you want to avoid the costly reality of a massive trial, and you certainly want to avoid the reality of the parents and the family members who love Lauren having to listen to the deviousness and the horror of what played out for their daughter in the public world around them because everyone's going to hear about it. The truth is that McDaniels to some degree gets away with being publicly pointed at as this horrible perpetrator. I know it's in the press etc but there is something very affronting about being in the public and being accused in the public and being found guilty in the public in such an obvious way Whereas because he says he's not guilty for a period of time, he's dealing with the possibility of getting away with it and then realises, well, actually, I'm not going to get away with it. So I'm going to do this on my terms. And my terms are I don't get to be charged with the sexual exploitation of kids and I don't get charged with the burglaries, but I do take responsibility for murdering Lauren. And in doing so, I stop myself having to go out there and be publicly vilified, so to speak. So he kind of controls things to some degree. Now, as part of the plea deal, he had to say exactly what happened to Lauren. And in his confession, he said that in the early morning of June 26, 2011, Stephen had broken into Lauren's apartment. He'd used a stolen master key to do so. He was wearing a pair of gloves. He had a mask on his face. And that is just truly terrifying to imagine that Lauren would have been confronted by this perpetrator dressed that way. Because you know, if someone's wearing gloves, if someone's wearing a mask, it's because they're forensically aware and they're trying to avoid somebody being able to pinpoint them for the crime. And that means that no matter what they're about to do to you, you're gonna immediately know it's something terrible. 
He'd apparently watched her in her sleep. How creepy is that? I know when it comes down to what we're talking about today, that's just so minimal compared to the crime. But what does that say about him? And also, how often had he done that? How often had he been in that apartment watching her as she slept? Now, apparently, he steps towards the bed. And at this point, the floor makes the creaking sound and it woke Lauren up. She wakes up. She shouts at him, get the fuck out. And then he starts strangling her while she's in the bed. She apparently fought her attacker and they both fell on the bed. And then amidst a struggle, she actually manages to pull the mask from his face and then she recognises him. So she then shouts, Stephen, please stop. And as she's trying to escape, her legs and her lower body basically move under the bed and that means that she can't use her legs to fight back and that's a huge amount of her body that is now disabled from fighting. He apparently had his hands around her neck for about 15 minutes. That's how long it takes before she stopped breathing. McDaniels then dragged Lauren into the bath. Then he returns to his apartment, allegedly spent all day online then came back to her apartment the following night, that's June the 27th, and it's at this point that he dismembers her whole body with a hacksaw. Then he puts her body in different bin bags and disposed of the different parts in different bins around the law school campus. And finally on June the 28th, he puts Lauren's torso in the bin by their apartment. So it's a really protracted experience for McDaniels and part of me wonders whether he got some grotesque joy out of fulfilling that fantasy he had about committing the perfect murder. Also, I don't buy into what he says about what happened to Lauren. You don't go into somebody's apartment wearing a mask and gloves if your intention is just to look at them whilst they're in bed. At the end of the day, there's no need to disguise yourself that way because they're asleep and you don't wish them any malice. One could say, well, maybe the mask, because that would arguably disguise the face. But did you ever see his hair? I mean, come on. In what universe would you just wake up and see somebody who disguised themselves, who wasn't really intending you any malice, and they're wearing a mask and gloves, and you'd be like, okay, I wouldn't recognise you, but actually... You literally have the biggest hair in the world and no one else in this area has hair like you, Matt Daniels. So it's clearly you. So why wear the mask? You're wearing the mask for two reasons. Like I said, he was never not going to be recognised by Lauren because his hair is so massive. So she would identify him straight away. But he wants her to be terrified. Because if she comes round and sees him looking like that, she knows it's him but she has the additional reality of the malevolence of his intention because he's got a mask on and he's got gloves on and she's going to know he's going to do something absolutely awful to her. And the fact that he's saying that it just happened in that moment, there was no planning, there was no prelude, just is ludicrous. When we talk about what I've just said regarding all of the information that he had stored at his apartment, all of this hateful content about women, and the fact that he felt angry with her because she hadn't been willing to romantically engage with him. This is somebody who I fully believe intended to kill her that night. And he can twist his words however he wishes and try to do mental gymnastics to explain why he ended up killing her as if it was just a crime in the moment. But it wasn't. He planned it. He fantasised about it. He asked others how to commit the perfect murder, taking tips from them. At the end of the day, he knew what he was doing. McDaniels even went on to say he was unable to account for how he could have committed these horrible acts. He said, it's difficult for me to explain why I killed Lauren and attempted to conceal my deed. I know they were very wrong. I'm not delusional or without all morals or decency. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Can I just run through that again? You know what you did wrong, basically, right? That's what you're saying. You don't understand how you did it, but you also want people to know that you aren't somebody who doesn't have morals or decency. I think you are literally the 
opposite of somebody with morals and decency. Just go through a few things, such as you wore a mask and gloves to go into the room of a girl who'd always been nice to you after stalking her for a very long time, after stealing a key so you could go and watch her when she was sleeping, after taking pictures and footage of her without her knowing, and then to add insult to injury once you had violently perpetrated the most grotesque murder of her, you literally dismember her body, deny her family a funeral by basically placing body parts all over campus to ensure that you would not be caught in your mind whilst her family would never get closure if her body was never found and she just seemingly disappeared into thin air. But that's decent, that's moral, you understand all that. I mean, literally, these individuals are so grossly negligent when it comes down to understanding how the average human being sees through that kind of BS. Also, I will tell you that his own attorneys were absolutely stunned at his confession because they had genuinely believed that he was completely innocent. He was convincing. What does that tell you? So yeah, he might be socially awkward, he might avoid big groups, he might be seen as somebody a little bit fringe, but he's also incredibly manipulative. He could coerce his own attorneys who are well-trained, well-versed, they've worked with guilty people regularly. They know when somebody on the whole is telling the truth or otherwise, but he fooled them. They genuinely thought he was innocent. Now, after McDaniels confessed and discussed what he did to Lauren, her mother said that the family was scarred forever by the sheer exquisite pain of missing her. God, I relate to that. I really do. The word exquisite can feel such a juxtaposition when you're talking about the loss and grief that you endure when you deal with traumatic loss. But I completely relate. My dad's suicide, I refer to the grief that I have for him in similar terms because it is my connector. It is the beautiful agony that only he inhabits. And I don't want rid of it. I like the pain because the pain is the thread of connection that I have between him and me. And I know exactly what Lauren's mother is saying by that sheer exquisite pain of missing her because that void is just filled with love. It really is. And it's beautifully put. And it's also very resonant of what good relationships do to us when we lose them. And Matt Daniels is never gonna experience that. No one's gonna have an exquisite pain of missing him. She also said that they'd been living in an unimaginable nightmare, wondering what horrors Lauren had endured. When Lauren's boyfriend, David, was asked to describe Lauren, he went on to say, I thought she was beautiful, intelligent, very level-headed, very laid back, very unassuming, very sharp-witted, and could always make me laugh. And I could make her laugh. And it's so important that we speak the truth about these victims and bring them to life because I don't know Lauren, and I never will, sadly, but I'd have loved to have. She sounds like such a fantastic human being to be around, and I think probably every single one of us relates to that. The world is a sadder place because her light no longer shines. Now in February 2018, as is typical in these situations, he tries to appeal his sentence, so he actually goes to court, and the reason he decides he wants to appeal his sentence is because he claims that he hadn't been informed his rights. You weren't informed of your rights? No, I wasn't informed of my rights. Really? Did you not know what your rights were? No, I didn't know what my rights were. Really? Because it feels a bit like you're trying to get off on a technicality here. No, I just didn't realise my rights. Didn't you take law when you doing the bar exam? Aren't you meant to be really academically inclined? Well, that's true, but... I didn't feel that my rights were explained to me. Okay, sorry, I'm just gonna have a conversation with... Malcolm, Malcolm, have you got the special big red buzzer to deal with people who've already been deviant and deceptive and are now trying to get away with some kind of technicality? Yes, that's right, the buzzer that sends them straight to hell. Nope, that's just one of my fantasy digressions there but I do feel that it would solve a lot of the world's problems if such a big 
red buzzer. If there was like the golden buzzer on Britain's Got Talent that could just be used for these legal scenarios. Do you know? Just throwing it out there. But of course, that's what he does. I was not informed of my rights. And he decided, you know what? I don't trust these lawyers because obviously I'm serving a 30 to life sentence. So why would I trust these lawyers when I myself could represent myself? Because obviously somebody who's gone down 30 years to life and been found bang to rights for the crime is going to be the kind of person that is going to absolutely be able to represent themselves appropriately in court. Probably was reading a book on Ted Bundy and got to the chapter where Ted Bundy decided that he would also represent himself. Didn't quite work out, did it though? Ted Bundy got executed January 1989, just throwing it out there. Maybe he hadn't got to the end of the chapter he was reading. But of course, he thinks he's clever, doesn't he? Because even though, and this is the irony, could you imagine being the judge in this case? Sorry, uh, what's that? I wasn't informed of my rights. Yeah, you, who are you? I'm Stephen McDaniels. I'm fighting for myself. Right. Why are you fighting for yourself if you are not au fait with the law? Oh, no, I am. I am au fait with the law. I'm very, very qualified in law. Hmm. But you're saying you weren't informed of your rights. Did you not know them? I see where you're going with this. It does seem ironic. At this point, that button and buzzer would be very effective, wouldn't it? Sorry. See you in the infinite burning hell well, I won't actually, because I'll be going in the other direction. Well, actually, I'll probably arrive in purgatory, but it'll be better than hell. That's all I'm saying. Anyway, this is where he goes. But of course, because he's representing himself, he decides that he's going to, in all his wisdom, call these former attorneys to the stand. And of course, these former attorneys he's accusing of making him plead guilty is like, you made me do this, so it's your fault. But of course, because they've called his attorneys to the stand, it means that those attorneys can talk freely. They're no longer bound by attorney-client privilege. So I don't know. He hasn't thought very clearly about this, has he? So one of his attorneys, Floyd Bufford, oh wow, he gave such a damning testimony against Stephen McDaniels. He said he had been strongly in his corner until the graphic, specific, detailed confession. So Wofford said that Stephen went into this, as he put it, terrific detail about how he killed Lauren Giddings, how he decapitated her, how he carved up a body, how he sat down and cut off every finger and thumb and threw it into the toilet and flushed them away. He said that Stephen McDaniels had literally gone into every gruesome detail. And that isn't necessary, is it? To me... That means that McDaniels is gratifying himself whilst talking about what he did to Lauren. And that attorney was affected by it. So he said that there was a real issue for Stephen McDaniels, not because of the advice that they'd given to him, but because of all the evidence against him, like the search history on his computer, including conversations about having sex with dead people, the fact that he had horrific child pornography photographs that... This lawyer said the worst he'd ever seen, in fact. So when it came down to the appeal, Stephen McDaniel's request for a new trial was denied. Denied. Sorry, what's that? Yeah, it's denied. It's denied. You absolute reprehensible creature. Now, Stephen McDaniels will actually be able to seek parole for the first time in 2041. But the district attorney, David Cook, said that he fully expects that Stephen McDaniel will spend the rest of his life behind bars. Amen. Because people like him should not be walking our streets. Since Lauren's murder, her family have been amazing. And they've actually created the Lauren Teresa Giddings Scholarship. And to take something that is truly traumatic, terrible that has literally created a chasm that can never be filled in your family and to try to carve something beautiful from it, it's testament to the amazing family that Lauren has because they've created this scholarship to pay for people who'd struggle to pay for a place at college. Even though they're academically strong, the financial problems would mean that they wouldn't be able to pursue that kind of academic connection and they've made it possible. And the Agnes Scott College, will they hold an annual 
memorial walk and a softball tournament in memory of Lauren. And again, the proceeds contribute towards that scholarship fund. And the parents said this about students who now have the opportunity to access it. If they could just enjoy and pursue their dreams a little bit in the way that Lauren did, we would be so happy. What incredible human beings. What an incredible, powerful legacy. Her name, her memory, her meaning. It will carry on and not just carry on. It will help to create the dreams of others. Dreams that would never happen without her family doing this. What's really sad is the rest of Lauren's body was never recovered. So her family never got to bring her home. And I think that's another thing that Matt Daniels stole from them. And it just demonstrates the callousness, the cold calculating behavior of this human predator who lived so silently in an apartment next door to this gorgeous human being. Unbeknown to her, plotting as far as I'm concerned, her demise for many, many months and almost, almost getting away with the perfect murder. Let me know your thoughts about this. If you know this case, I hope I've given you some extra information. Just wanna say what absolute heroes I think Lauren's family are. And I hope the students that benefit from her legacy carry her name with them all their lives because she really did help to create the possibilities and success that they will hopefully pursue and achieve. Take care guys, see you again. Much love, be safe.